Hi everyone. So for this um, video, we're going to go over experiment two. Experiment two has the longest uh, prelab of the whole semester. You actually need three prelabs, one for part one, one for part two, and one for part three. Because they're each a little bit different, you do need three prelabs. Remember, each prelab should contain a title, objective, hypothesis, variables, experimental outline, chemical hazards and waste, and key math, and key math equations. So what I'm going to do in this video is for each part of the experiment, like for say, exam for example, part one, like dissolves like, I'm gonna show you um, a little bit about the theory of the experiment, as well as a video where we actually demonstrate how to do some of the um, experimental work. So after we do that, we'll then come back and talk a little bit about the prelab. And I'm actually gonna give you some of the answers. And then we'll repeat for parts two and parts three of the experiment. In all cases, we'll try to give you some ideas about some common mistakes um, that are made in the experiment, how to manipulate the data, how to use the micro lab, how to measure um, uh, conductivity, and all of these types of things. Being prepared for this experiment is essential. If you're not prepared, it will be challenging to finish in the allotted time. So watching this video will certainly help you become more prepared. In this experiment, you will be testing like dissolves like, which is a simple three word term chemists use to decide whether or not a solution is likely to form. Here, you can see that oil and water do not mix. Like dissolves like is a way chemists can predict that oil and water will not form a solution. Before continuing with like dissolves like, we need to know a little bit about the difference between covalent and ionic compounds because they play a role. Here, we're gonna look at the simple definitions of the difference between covalent and ionic. However, as you study chemistry, you will have a deeper and deeper understanding of these concepts. Covalent compounds occur between two nonmetals shown here in yellow. Notice that hydrogen is also a nonmetal. So for example, water, which is an oxygen and two hydrogens, is a covalent compound. Hexane, which is made of six carbons and 14 hydrogens, is also a covalent compound. So covalent compounds occur between two or more nonmetals. Ionic compounds, on the other hand, generally contain a metal. So for example, sodium chloride, which is an ionic compound, contains sodium and chloride, which is a metal and a nonmetal forming an ionic compound. Now that we've considered the difference between covalent and ionic, we need to get back to the ultimate goal of our experiment, which is to test like dissolves like and see when we can form a solution. Solutions form between solvents and solutes. In this slide, we want to look at two different solvents, in this case, hexane and water. Both hexane and water are covalent compounds because they contain only nonmetals. However, covalent compounds can be further subdivided into nonpolar and polar. As you study chemistry, your understanding of the difference between polar and nonpolar will become far greater. However, generally speaking, Something that contains a relatively large number of carbons and hydrogens relative to the number of oxygens in it is nonpolar. In this case, hexane contains no oxygens and contains six carbons and 14 hydrogens, so it is a nonpolar solvent. Water, on the other hand, contains only oxygen and hydrogen and no carbons, so it is a polar solvent. In like dissolves like, Nonpolar solutes, or solutes that contain relatively large numbers of carbons and hydrogens relative to the number of oxygens, will dissolve in hexane, but not water. Or polar solutes, which contain large numbers of oxygens relative to the number of carbons and hydrogens, will be soluble in polar solvents, like water. That is what like dissolved likes means. In terms of ionic compounds, where there's a metal and a nonmetal, ionic compounds are soluble in polar solvents, but are not soluble in nonpolar solvents. Now that we've talked about the different types of solvents that we're going to use, which are 
hexane, a nonpolar solvent, and water, a polar solvent, let's look at the individual solutes that we have to consider. Remember that we're ultimately trying to test like dissolves like. What is like is the polarity, um, in the case of covalent compounds, or that ionic compounds are like polar solvents. If we look at sugar, we can notice that it has a relatively large number of oxygens in it. These molecules that are not shown here are actually representing carbons. However, sugar contains a very large number of oxygens, which makes it polar. Therefore, we would expect sugar to dissolve in a polar solvent like water and should not dissolve in a nonpolar solvent like hexane. If we look at vitamin C or ascorbic acid, we again notice that there's a relatively large number of oxygens compared to the carbons, which are shown here, but not actually explicitly labeled. In this case, the large number of oxygens again makes ascorbic acid polar, so it should be soluble in a polar solvent water because it's like water and should not be soluble in a nonpolar solvent like hexane. Here we have lauric acid. Lauric acid contains a large number of carbons and a small number of oxygens, in this case only two. This means lauric acid is mostly nonpolar. Therefore, it should dissolve in a nonpolar solvent like hexane because it is like hexane and it is not like the polar solvent water. So this one is soluble in hexane and not water. As we discussed before, ionic compounds like sodium chloride, which we know is ionic because it contains a metal, is going, are going to be soluble in polar solvents and are not going to be soluble in nonpolar solvents. Now that we have looked at some of the theoretical aspects of like dissolves like, it's time to look at some of the practical things you're gonna to need to do in the lab in order to test this experiment. So what I have here is some water and some hexane, those are my solvents. Water is a polar solvent and hexane is a nonpolar solvent. And I also have the solute sugar. As you know, sugar is a polar solute. So we're gonna test the solubility of these things. Before I can begin, I need to add um, each of the solvents to a test tube. But both solvents are clear liquids, so before I add them, I wanna go ahead and label my test tubes. So I'm gonna label one test tube as hexane and another test tube as water. Now we're going to do this experiment qualitatively. So that means we don't need to actually measure the amount of water in hexane that we add to the test tube. We just need to add an inch or two into the bottom. So for the water test tube, I'm going to simply pour a small amount of water into the first test tube. And for the hexane test tube, I'm going to go ahead and use a pipette in order to transfer the hexane. Now it takes approximately two pipettes full of hexane to get an inch or two into the bottom of the test tube. Now that we've added the solvents to the test tubes, it's time to test the solubility of sugar in each of the solvents. To do that, I'm gonna simply get a small amount of sugar at the end of a spatula, like so. I'm then gonna add the small amount of sugar into the test tube containing a solvent, in this case, hexane. In order to test to see if the solute is soluble, I'm gonna go ahead and add a stirring rod. I want to gently swirl the solution to see if any of the sugar will dissolve. As you can see, the sugar is unable to dissolve in hexane. This is because hexane is a nonpolar solvent and sugar is a polar solute. Therefore, they are not alike and the sugar will not dissolve. Next, we'll test to see if sugar is soluble in water. I again wanna use the, this time use the water test tube and I wanna get a small amount of sugar, just like I did with the hexane. I'm going to add the sugar into the test tube containing water, and again, insert a glass stirring rod. I want to gently swirl the solution to see if the sugar will dissolve in water. Of course, we all know that sugar is soluble in water. This is because sugar is a polar solute and water is a polar solvent. Therefore, they are alike and the sugar is able to dissolve. One common mistake that can be made while performing this experiment is using too much solute. To demonstrate that, I'm just gonna grab another test tube and add an inch or two of water to the bottom. Note that the exact amount of water 
still does not matter as this is a qualitative experiment. After adding some water to the test tube, I'm going to go ahead and this time grab a large amount of solute, like this. Now of course, sugar is soluble in water. However, if I add a massive amount of sugar to the test tube, and then I simply insert the glass stirring rod and gently stir the, stir the solution, you'll notice that the sugar is not able to dissolve in water. This isn't because sugar isn't soluble in water, which of course we, know it all, we all know it is, it's simply because we've exceeded the saturation limit. So it's really important that when you're doing this experiment that you use the appropriate amount of sugar, which is a very small amount. The final thing we need to do is clean up. The first thing is to make sure that you dispose of the hexane into the appropriate waste container. After the hexane is disposed of, it's very important that we take care of all the labels on any glassware that we've used. We wanted to use this beaker for water, but the next person might want to use it for something else. In order to do that, we simply use an alcohol swab. The ink of a Sharpie is soluble in alcohol, so therefore it will easily wipe off when removed with an alcohol swab. We can simply remove all the labels from the, any glassware that we used and then dispose of the alcohol swab in the garbage can. Now that we've looked at the um experimental details in the theory for part one, like dissolves like, let's look at the pre-lab. The first thing you're going to need is a title. Well, you can use our title, like dissolves like. Next, you need an objective. Well, your objective here is to test the solubility of four solutes, salt, water, or excuse me, salt, vitamin C, sugar, and lauric acid in two solvents. And those two solvents are water and hexane. So the objective is to test the solubility of four solutes, salt, vitamin C, sugar, and lauric acid in two solvents, hexane and water. Next, we need the hypothesis. And when it comes to the hypothesis, I strongly suggest you use the lab manual. And this is on page 43 of the lab manual. And it says sentence one should contain a specific prediction of whether sugar, vitamin C, and lauric acid are soluble in water or hexane. Be sure to include a prediction for each solute in both solvents. So sugar and vitamin C should be soluble in water and not hexane. Lauric acid should be soluble in hexane and not water. The second sentence should contain the following. The polarity and so, um, solubility of sugar and vitamin C. Sugar and vitamin C are both polar. So therefore, they should be soluble in the polar solvent water and not soluble in the non-polar solvent vitamin C. The types of bonds which make sugar and vitamin C polar are the carbon-oxygen and oxygen-hydrogen bonds. The third sentence should contain the polarity and solubility of lauric acid and the types of bonds um, in lauric acid that make it non-polar. So lauric acid is a non-polar solute, so it should dissolve in non-polar hexane and not polar water. Lauric acid is non-polar because of the carbon-hydrogen bonds. So this is how you could write your entire hypothesis. And I basically just, you know, kind of told you what it is here. Note that on subsequent pages, there are um, examples uh, how to write the sentences for part two and part three, and we'll discuss those later. Coming back over here, however, we now need the variables. Here, um, the independent variables are the solutes and the solvents, and whether they're nonpolar or polar, and the dependent variable is whether or not it will dissolve. So that's what we're actually testing. We're testing solubility. The experimental outline, I'm not going to go through in detail because in the previous part of the experiment, we actually showed you how to do the experiment. So you can get the experimental outline for there. Chemical hazards and waste. Um, hexane is flammable and somewhat toxic and should be used in the hood. Also, it should be disposed of in the appropriate waste container. And key math equations doesn't apply to this part because there's no math. This is completely qualitative, which means we're not going to use any math uh, to do anything. In this portion of the experiment, we're going to study electrolytes. You may have heard of electrolytes from sports drinks such as Gatorade. But have you ever wondered what an electrolyte is?
Conductivity is generally studied in aqueous solutions, meaning that water is the solvent. In this case, we'll study the conductivity of salt water and sugar water. Salt is an electrolyte because it is an ionic compound which is soluble in water. When salt dissolves, it breaks up into ions, sodium plus and chloride minus. These ions are capable of transferring an electrical charge. Therefore, we can measure a substantial conductivity of salt water. Sugar, on the other hand, is a covalent compound because it does not contain any metals. When it dissolves in water, which it does because it's polar like water, it is not able to transfer an electrical charge because there are no ions in solution. Therefore, if we measure the conductivity of a sugar water solution, we expect it to be negligible. In order to determine the conductivity of the solutions, we first need to make them. Here, I'm going to make the sugar water solution. In order to do that, I want to start by taking a labeled Erlenmeyer flask and placing it onto the balance. I then simply close the doors and press the tear button. Tear will zero the balance with the Erlenmeyer flask on it. Once the Erlenmeyer flask has been teared, we simply add the solute. In this case, notice how I'm using my left hand to hold the sugar and my right hand to hold the spatula. I then add some sugar into the Erlenmeyer flask. Here I want to add approximately one gram of sugar. Once I've added approximately one gram of sugar, I want to close the balance doors and record the exact mass that is displayed. Notice that this is not exactly one gram of sugar. We simply write the, the mass that we have added in our laboratory notebooks. In order to measure the conductivity, we need to use a conductance probe. Begin by inserting the cord into the conductance port on the front of the microlab. Now that the conductivity probe has been plugged into the microlab, we need to open the microlab software. To do this, we simply click on the microlab icon on the desktop. You'll notice that it says reading from flash memory. This ensures that the microlab is properly connected to the computer. If you do not see this, it's probably because the microlab is off, the microlab is unplugged, or it's not properly connected to the computer by the USB cord. Check all of these things before consulting the TA for further assistance. Once the microlab software is opened, we need to double click on microlab experiment. This will open a window which will allow us to collect data. In this case, we want to collect data about conductivity. To add the conductivity sensor, we click add sensor. Under sensor type, we select conductivity. In the display that shows the front of the microlab, we must also click on the conductivity icon. In this case, we want to click 0 to 20,000 microsiemens because that's the range in which we want to work. We want to use factory calibration, so we simply click on use factory calibration. You'll notice that this shows us a conductivity measurement in this window here. Once we have the conductivity probe attached to the microlab and the microlab software ready to make a measurement, we first want to clean the conductivity probe by swirling it in some deionized water. As you can see, there is a small conductivity reading as the probe is swirled in deionized water. Then simply use a paper towel to dry the conductivity probe as best you can. It's not essential that it's 100% dry. In order to measure the conductivity of the solution of interest, you want to have it in a 50 milliliter beaker which is approximately half full of the solution. Then simply insert the conductivity probe into the solution. Once the probe has been inserted into the solution, swirl the probe for 15 or 20 seconds. Notice here that there is a relatively large conductivity. This is because salt is a strong electrolyte and therefore the current is able to pass and we measure that as a conductivity in microsiemens. As I swirl the probe, you'll notice that the reading stabilizes, not completely. Here you can see that in the tens place, the number is jumping around a little bit. Simply record a value that is approximately being displayed by the instrument. Here I would record 11,270. After making the conductivity measurement, it's important to clean the probe. To do that, simply insert the probe into a beaker of DI water and swirl it around. Then, wipe the probe dry with a paper towel. Now that we have discussed part two electrolytes, let's take a look at um, the pre-lab again. Now I'm not gonna go through the title, the objective, but I do wanna talk about the hypothesis. And again, for writing the hypothesis, we do wanna use uh, the lab manual. And on this version, it's on page 44 for the part two hypothesis. And it says sentence one should contain a specific prediction of the degree to which salt and sugar water will change the conductivity of pure water. And we know 
that salt should have a significant impact on the conductivity of pure water, while sugar should have a minimal um, impact on the conductivity, and in fact it should remain unchanged. The second sentence should contain the following, whether salt is an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte, whether salt is ionic or covalent, and the ions in solution when salt dissolves. And not necessarily in this order, but we could say something along the lines of salt is an electrolyte because it is an ionic compound which dissociates into sodium plus ions, Na plus, and Cl minus ions in solution. And that sentence would uh, fit for part two. The third sentence should contain the following, whether sugar is an electrolyte or non-electrolyte, whether sugar is an ionic or covalent compound, and the ions or lack thereof in solution when sugar dissolves. So we could say something along the lines of sugar is a non-electrolyte because it is a covalent compound which does not dissociate into ions in solution and therefore the electrical current can't be transferred. So we can use this uh, to develop the hypothesis. And in fact, it's very helpful for that. So we want to use that. Coming back over here, um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I do want to talk about the variables. Um, here, the independent variables are, in one solution we put salt, in one solution we put sugar. Um, you could also argue that the concentration of the salt and the sugar water solution that we make are independent variables, because we control the amount of water and we control the amount of salt and sugar in each solution. Note that it is two separate solutions. The, de the dependent variable here is the conductivity, because that's what we're actually measuring experimentally. When it comes to the experimental outline, again, I'm going to leave that to the um, previous part of the video where we actually show what's going on. And for chemical hazards and waste, um, there's not too many chemical hazards and waste here. We just have salt water and sugar water. It is very important that we clean the conductivity probes. And like before, there are no key math equations because this is a qualitative experiment. In this section of the experiment, you'll be using calibration curves. Calibration curves are very useful to scientists because they allow us to relate things that are relatively easy to measure, like conductivity, to things that are more difficult to measure, like salt concentration. In this experiment, you will generate a calibration curve. However, you will use calibration curves throughout general chemistry and beyond. Before looking at the specific calibration curve you will generate in this course, let's look at the general information that can be found on a calibration curve. On the x-axis, we generally have the independent variable. This is the variable that the experimenter is changing. In this case, you are making a series of solutions with different concentrations. Therefore, your independent variable is solution concentration, and you are doing it in mass percent units. The y-axis generally contains the dependent variable. That is the variable that the experimenter is measuring. In this case, you are measuring the conductivity of each of your solutions. The dependent variable is conductivity and the unit is microsiemens per centimeter. When the values are graphed on Excel using an XY scatter, you will get the equation of a line. Y equals M, the slope, X plus B, the Y intercept. So the slope in this case is 0.995 and the Y intercept is 0.029. Another value that you will get is the R squared value. R squared measures how well the data points fit the curve. An R squared of 0.99 or better is generally considered acceptable in a general chemistry course. It is important to point out that R squared does not measure anything about the accuracy or the precision of your data. It simply measures that the curve fits the data well. And if you look here, the linear regression goes through most of the data points. Now, let's look at the actual graph you will be generating in the lab. It is titled salt water conductivity, the dependent variable, versus concentration, the independent variable. The independent variable is on the x-axis, and the dependent variable is on the y-axis. When the line is graphed, you get the equation of the line, which is automatically generated by Excel as y equals mx plus b. You also get an R squared of 0.9998 in this case, which means that the curve fits the data well. In your case, you may get slightly different conductivities than are shown here. However, 
you should still get an R squared of 0.99 or higher when you do the experiment. A calibration curve can be used because we can easily measure the conductivity of an unknown by simply inserting the conductivity probe. Once we have that conductivity, it's a Y value. If we plug that value into the equation of the line, we can solve for X, the concentration. This allows us to determine the concentration of an unknown by simply measuring its conductivity. Before we can generate the calibration curve, we first need to make a series of solutions. The first solution that you're going to make is a 5% NaCl solution starting from solid NaCl. Here, we will determine how much solid NaCl we should use to make 75 milliliters of the 5% NaCl solution. Percentages can be converted into qualities for a dimensional analysis. In the case of a 5% NaCl solution, 5.00 grams of NaCl is equal to 100 grams solution. Because a percentage is the part divided by the whole times 100, or the part out of 100 parts, generally speaking, the percentage amount of parts, in this case, 5 grams of NaCl, equals 100 amounts of the whole, in this case, 100 grams of solution. Now that we have our equality, we can start with our 75 grams solution. And we can use this number along with dimensional analysis in order to figure out how much NaCl we need. To do that, we need to decide whether the 100 grams of solution or the 5 grams of NaCl goes on the bottom. Because we have grams of solution and we want grams of solution to cancel out, we decide to put 100 grams solution on the bottom of our dimensional analysis equation. On top, we put our 5.00 grams of NaCl. Next, we simply do the math. To do that, we multiply by the top, then divide by the bottom. When we do the math, we get 3.75 grams of NaCl. This tells us that in order to make our solution, we need to add 3.75 grams of NaCl. In order to determine how to make our solution, we need to figure out how much water we need. To do that, we take our 75.0 grams solution and we subtract 3.75 grams of NaCl. This tells us that we should need 71.3 grams of water. Since the density of water is approximately one, we can simply add around 71 milliliters of water. To summarize, we have calculated that we need to add approximately 3.75 grams of NaCl to a teared Erlenmeyer flask. Then, using a graduated cylinder, we can add around 71 milliliters of water to the same Erlenmeyer flask. The flask should be swirled until the salt has completely dissolved and a solution is formed. When the solution is actually made, it will be impossible to get 3.7500 grams. Therefore, you're going to actually have to calculate the mass percent of the solution that was generated. In this case, in the lab, we used 3.7290 grams of NaCl, and once we added the water, we got 75.1610 grams of solution. We now need to find the mass percent of the solution. Mass percent like any other percentage, is the part divided by the whole times 100. In this case, the part is the mass of the solute, and the whole is the mass of the entire solution. Remember that the numbers here were found in the lab by actually measuring the amount of NaCl that was added and the total mass of the solution. To plug in our values, we put in 3.7290 grams of NaCl on top over 75.1610 grams of solution on the bottom. To make it the percentage, or the part out of 100, we simply multiply by 100. Finally, we do the math 
and to the correct number of significant figures, we find that the solution that we actually made is 4.9613% by mass sodium chloride. To summarize, in the first step, we calculated how much NaCl was required to make 75 milliliters of a 5% NaCl solution. In the second step, because it's impossible to add exactly 3.75 grams or to make exactly 75 milliliters of solution, we calculated the actual mass percent of the solution that we generated using the masses that we measured in the lab. Now that we have determined the concentration of NaCl, we need to look at dilutions so that we can make the other solutions required for our calibration curve. Of course, we could make all of these solutions starting from solid NaCl, but dilution is a quick and convenient way chemists use to take a more concentrated solution and make it into a less concentrated solution. Chemists and chemistry students use dilutions all the time. So before we take a look at the mathematical aspects of dilutions, it's important that we have an understanding of what a dilution is. Here, we have a relatively concentrated saltwater solution depicted. When more water is added, we have the same amount of solute, but we have a much larger volume of solution. Therefore, the solution has become more dilute. So generally speaking, to perform a dilution, we add more solvent. In the case of a saltwater solution, the solvent is water. So to dilute a saltwater solution, we add more water. In order to determine the exact amount of water that should be added to the approximately 5% solution to make, say, a 4% solution of NaCl, we need to use the dilution equation. The dilution equation is used regularly by chemists, and you will use it repeatedly in this course, so it is important that you spend some time becoming familiar with it. The dilution equation shown here is C1B1 equals C2V2, where C1 is the initial concentration, V1 is the initial volume, C2 is the final concentration, and V2 is the final volume. Now that we have the dilution equation, let's see how we can apply it to figure out how to make a 4% NaCl solution. Here, our goal is to take the 4.9613% NaCl solution and figure out how much is required to make 25 milliliters of the 4% solution. In the lab, you're going to have to make a 4%, 3%, 2%, and 1% solution. In each case, you will want to make 25 milliliters. Here, we will perform the calculation for making the 4% solution. You can perform similar calculations to make your other solutions. In order to perform the calculation, we're going to need to use the dilution equation. C1V1 equals C2V2. C1 is the initial concentration in this case, 4.9613%. V1 is the initial volume. In this case, it is the variable. Equals C2, the final concentration that we're trying to make, which in this case is 4.00%. Times V2, the final volume that we're trying to make, which in this case is 25.0 milliliters. To solve for V1, we first multiply the two numbers together, 4 times 25, which is 100, and then divide by the number next to the variable, in this case 4.9613. When we do that, we find that V1 equals 20.2 milliliters. Now that we know the volume of the approximately 5% NaCl solution that is required, we need to figure out how much water we need to add to it. In order to determine the volume of H2O, we need to take the 25 milliliters of solution and subtract the volume of the 5% NaCl that we need to add, which equals 25.0 milliliters minus 20.2 milliliters. When we do this math, we find that we need to add 4.8 milliliters of water. Practically speaking, we need to use a graduated cylinder to measure 20.2 milliliters of the approximately 5% solution and add it into a 125 milliliters flask. We then need to use a graduated cylinder to add 4.8 milliliters of water to the flask. The flask is then swirled, the solution is transferred to a 50 milliliter beaker, and the conductivity can be measured. Doing a dilution allows us to make 
and measure the conductivity of a 4% salt water solution. This calculation can be repeated to form a 3%, 2%, and 1% solution. Before lab, you should have all of these calculations performed in your notebook so that you can quickly make the solutions and perform the experiment in the allotted time. In the lab, it's generally a good idea to measure the conductivity of the solutions you make before you make all of the solutions for your calibration curve. So for example, if you make a 5% solution and it has a conductivity of 10,000, when you dilute this solution into a 4% solution, which is 80% of the concentration, it should have 80% of the conductivity, or 8,000. If you measure the conductivity of the 4% solution, and it's very different from 8,000, there may be something else going on that should be fixed before you make all the rest of your solutions. Remember that these numbers are simplified to illustrate a point, but generally speaking, if the concentration of the solution is 80%, the conductivity should also be 80%. You should check these values and measure the conductivities of each of the solutions as you make them. Once the conductivity of all of the solutions has been measured, the data can be imported into Excel where we can make the calibration curve. In Excel, the saltwater concentrations in mass percent should be placed in column A, and the conductivities in microsiemens per centimeter should be placed in column B. You'll notice that I've also added the unknown conductivity in row 8 shown here. Once the data has been entered into Excel, we want to make the XY scatter to generate the calibration curve. To do this, first select the data of known concentration and conductivities. Click on Insert, select XY scatter, and choose the top left option. Next, you'll want to change the chart layout so that that way you can add the appropriate titles and labels to the graph. To do this, simply select Quick Layout and choose the top left option. We do not need the Series 1 label, so it can be deleted by simply clicking on it and hitting the Delete key. Next, we want to title the x-axis, which is Salt Water Concentration, and it's in percent by mass. Salt Water Concentration is the independent variable, which is why it's on the x-axis. Next, we need to label the y-axis as conductivity. Conductivity is in microsiemens per centimeter, but micro is not a keyboard key. To add a label, click on Insert, Symbol, find the micro symbol, click Insert, and close the symbol window, and then continue with the label. Conductivity is the dependent variable, and therefore on the y-axis. The final label that we need is the chart title. To add a chart title, click on chart title and put salt water conductivity, the dependent variable, versus concentration, the independent variable. In the teaching lab, you and your instructor are generally aware of the data being graphed. However, graphs are usually used to transmit data to others. Therefore, it's essential that you learn how to properly label a graph and submit properly labeled graphs in your lab reports. Now that the graph has been properly labeled, it's time to insert a trend line. To do this, simply click on one of the data points. Next, right-click the mouse and select Add Trend Line. You'll notice that over here a new window appears. You want to use a linear regression which is the default option. You also want to display the equation and the R-squared value on the chart, which is displayed here. This data has an R-squared of 0.9995, which tells us that the curve fits the data well. You'll notice that all of the data points are actually on the line. You'll notice that Excel also gives us the equation of the line. We can use this equation along with the unknown conductivity, which is a Y-value, to solve for x and determine the concentration of the unknown. The concentration of the unknown can be determined right in Excel. First, I'm going to label a cell unknown concentration. Once that is done, I'm going to use a new cell and type in an equal sign. Equals tells Excel that it has to do a calculation. Because there is both adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing involved, an order of operations will become an issue, I'm going to use parentheses. First, I want to take the unknown 
conductivity value and subtract 5961.1. After I've subtracted the B value, I want to divide by the slope, or 2306.2. This is the concentration in mass percent of the unknown, or 3.31%. Just like calculators, Excel gives us far too many significant figures. Of course, you could also solve this equation by hand. Here, we have the exact same problem that we had before and just use Excel to solve. And we're given the equation of the line and the conductivity of the unknown. In order to solve this, we need to rearrange the equation of the line because we have a y value and we want to solve for x. To do that, we first subtract the 5961.1 from both sides. That leaves us with y minus 5961.1 equals 2306.2x. Next, we want to divide both sides by the 2306.2 in order to isolate x. When we do that, we get x equals y minus 5961.1 divided by 2306.2. Notice that I've put the subtraction in parentheses because I want to make sure that I do that first. Next, we simply want to plug in our unknown conductivity, which is a y value, and solve for x. x equals 13,600 minus 5961.1, and we want to do that first. We want to take the result of that and divide by 2306.2. When you do that math, not surprisingly, you get the same answer, which is 3.31% salt by concentration. We have now found the concentration of the unknown by multiple methods. Both will work, whether you do the math by hand or whether you do it by Excel. What's really important to remember is what we've ultimately accomplished. We have generated a calibration curve by measuring the conductivity of a series of known concentration saltwater solutions. We've then used the calibration curve to determine the concentration of an unknown. Calibration curves allow scientists to find things that are difficult to measure, like concentration of salt in an unknown solution, and relate them to things that are relatively easy to measure, like conductivity, which can be measured by simply inserting a conductivity probe. Now that we've taken a look at part three, let's again talk about the prelab. And I'm going to again skip the title and the hypothesis, or excuse me, the title and the objective, and go directly to the hypothesis. So I'm back into the lab manual, and it says sentence one should contain a specific prediction of the amount of salt, sodium chloride, in the seawater sample. If you Google how much salt is in seawater, you will find that it's about 3.5% um, salt. So that could be your specific prediction. The second sentence should contain the following. Calibration curve, x and y axis variables, and purpose of the calibration curve. So there, your calibration curve should have, the calibration curve will have x variable of concentration, and the y variable will be conductivity. The calibration curves allow scientists to relate um, data that's relatively easy to measure, like conductivity, to data they might be interested in, like concentration of salt. And that could be the second sentence. The third sentence should contain the following. The type of proportionality between uh, conductivity and concentration. Why there is a relationship between concentration of ionic compound and conductivity. So conductivity and concentration are directly proportional because as concentration increases, there are a larger number of ions in solution, which allows more electrons to flow, thereby increasing the conductivity. So in this way, we could write the hypothesis uh, for part three of the experiment. Skipping back over, I did want to also talk about the variables, and I will again skip the experimental outline, the chemical hazards and wastes, and the key math equations. In this case, um, probably the independent variable that we care about the most is concentration, because you're going to make uh, each of the solutions 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, and 5%. And the dependent variable is the conductivity, which you're going to measure.
The final thing that I want to mention is that once you've written all of this pre-lab, which I understand is quite extensive, this is the vast majority of the writing. If you flip to page 60 of the lab manual, you will find how to write the conclusions, which is very similar to how to write the hypotheses, where you're essentially going to comment on whether your experimental data matched your hypothesis. Um, and you could do that for each section, just like you've done uh, here. Note that that's the only writing part that you have to do during the lab. There are also post-lab questions, and those post-lab questions uh, can be done as well. So uh, you can find those uh, in your lab manual. Um, so if you want to do those before class, that will help you as well. So thanks for taking the time to watch this. This is a long experiment. I know this was a relatively long video, but I do hope that this helped you prepare for lab and being prepared for lab will make the lab a less stressful place and it will make it more enjoyable and you'll get more out of it. So thanks for taking the time.